Very fortunate to have with us all the way from Mexico, Bhikkhu Rahula, with his topic, Making the Dhamma Alive. Venerable Rahula first came into contact with the Buddhist teachings while in Japan on a course of SN Goinka in 2001. He has been living in Asia for 16 years, studying and practicing the Dhamma. Bhikkhu Rahula was first ordained in 2004 and received direct guidance from the Venerable Sayadaw Ute Janiya. In 2011, he started the studies of Suttas and Abhidhamma in Macau with Venerable Sayadaw Dr. Uka Sachara, who later led him to further study with the most venerable Sayadaw Dr. Nandamala Vibhamsa, with whom he had underwent higher ordination. In 2019, Bhante completed a course in Buddhist scriptures from Harvard University. He has translated and collaborated in the edition of various Dharma books in Spanish and English. For the past six years, Bhante has offered a weekly course, Applied Abhidhamma for participants of all ages in Mexico. His YouTube channel, Anatomy of the Mind, is followed by students in more than 10 Spanish speaking countries. At present, Bhante is undergoing intensive training, continuing the studies of the Dhamma Vinaya in Sasana Raka Buddhist Sanctuary in Taiping, Malaysia, under the guidance of Venerable Arya Damika. For the past four years, Bhante has been constructing and continues working on the development of the Mexican Buddhist Center to introduce and propagate the Buddhist teachings in his native country. Let us put our palms together to invite Bhante to deliver his message on making the Dhamma alive. Over to you, Bhante. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Welcome, everybody. We are at home, everybody, here in SBS. Everything the day is very clear and everything is okay. So uh, let's start with the exploration. Thank you for the introduction. And I will just show you some images about uh, the teachers. So you, you get to know, I, I suppose maybe, say Aruta Genia, you know already. So I will share the screen right now and we will uh, do an exploration on how we can bring all the teachings alive into our own experience and, and making them uh, work for uh, more closely. You, you will see. So I start sharing the screen. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. So let's start. So now the teachers that were introduced, uh, this is uh, El Most Venerable Seado Unandamala Bhivansa, my preceptor, and uh, with whom I've been studying the uh, Abhidhamma, Dhamma and Vinaya. And also it was mentioned, uh, Sayadu Tejaniya, which has made some retreats here in Malaysia and also here in SBS, that, that through him it was the way that I came to, to know about SBS. And then I had the long, long time wanting to come, wanting to come. And finally, all the, all the conditions came together. And now under the guidance of, of Venerable Ariya Damika, having a very uh, fruitful, I feel, stay, mostly because we are little, little monks right now here. So we have plenty of time to discuss and explore and share. And also, as it was mentioned in Mexico, out of circumstance, uh, I arrived a few years ago, five years ago there, I came with the ropes. And then some friends, a small group of friends and my own mother asked, what, what did you learn in, in Asia? What, what, what is the Buddha's teaching? So I say, okay, we'll start sharing to them a little bit at home. Uh, and the home that I was staying, there, 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 is a, uh, there was not yet the monastery. I still is still under development. So um, I started a little bit and then suddenly the friend said, oh, I think a friend would like this. Uh, he, he or she is having some uh, issues with the mind. Maybe it's going to be useful. Can I invite? I say, OK. And then I say, OK, OK. And then it started growing, growing. Finally, people started bringing the whole family. Sometimes we have uh, uh, the three generations there. So we started growing. This is the group uh, that was mentioned, six, uh, uh, six years already exploring the Dhamma, Abhidhamma, and people coming from all ages. Then uh, some uh, invitations start getting for going to hospitals, talking to doctors. You will see a little bit more. But the point that I'm doing is that uh, the Dhamma, it's, uh, we must find a way, really something very that I dedicate my, my, much of the time is to get the teachings and try to make them 
available at any moment, especially when, when talking to children, how to talk to them so they see the benefit, not just telling them what to do, but uh, what is the reason behind? What is the meaningfulness and the usefulness of it? So today, uh, today topic, we'll be covering uh, that attitude more than teachings, I, I suppose. I have seen the good work that uh, all the societies have been doing throughout the years. People is well informed. So today we will be uh, focusing a little bit more on the attitude on to how to approach the teachings and uh, make them relevant in any uh, situation of life. So this session is gonna be full of tips. If you wish to have a, a, a note around so you can uh, write them and it's also being recorded. So in case uh, you wish to just focus, it will be also uh, available later on. So if everybody ready, everybody ready, let's uh, put our uh, spiritual safety belts and we will have a journey, journey inside and journey into the Dhamma. It's a, it's a wonderful day today that we can do that all, all of us together. So when the Buddha speak about the Dhamma, it generally is talking about the individual because that the aim of the Dhamma, as we know, is the attendance of the, of the mind of all of us individuals and how to uh, recognize negative tendencies and how to use the energy that was being used on negativity, change it onto positive, what we know as right effort. So generally in all the teachings, the Buddha is talking about us. Only the deeper we start going, the beginning is very clear, of course, we can see it also in the suttas, the Buddha was talking to the individual, but then when the individual knew a little bit more and was exploring deeper inside, then we start finding some other, uh, other uh, descriptions about ourselves. Sometimes we may find that the next step will be, yes, this is, this is me, this is you, but we are actually a combination of materiality, matter, this, this body, and the mind, the consciousness that is going there. And then if we go further, this happens to all of us as the more we study, then we start seeing that actually, these also have the, the mind itself have different parts. Then we arrive to the five aggregates of Panchakanda. And then we start seeing more definitions are a little bit more clear. Yes, our mind is working, it's related to the body. It is the puppeteer and the puppet is the body, but inside the mind, there are a few more ingredients. We have the consciousness, we have the mental sensation or mental feeling, the Edana Kanda or feeling aggregate. We also have the perception, the, the different kinds of perceptions that we have, each one based on each of the senses. And then we also have the Sankara Kanda or the mental formations aggregate. So the deeper we go, sometimes it has, it has happened to me, and this is the point I'm, I'm trying to get, the deeper we go, at some time we start, why it has happened, I start losing myself. And then I start thinking on theory. And then uh, later on, it becomes just the thinking about the Dhamma instead of an applying the Dhamma, especially when we go to deeper uh, and more detailed descriptions about ourselves. When we speak about the 12 bases, all the senses and their objects, the 18 elements, but and then it becomes, it sometimes I, I have felt it personally that it goes quite, quite far. And then I really ask, where am I on this? So this next tip, the first tip that we will uh, uh, explore in order not to get lost into, into the theory or, or just the, having the Dhamma outside what the teachers and the monks says, I want to share this treasure that has been for me a very simple question that I have kept through the years, and is it regardless how deep the Dhamma that I'm exploring, it could be the Abhidhamma, the mental ingredients, or the, 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 the materiality of, 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 the, of, uh, of the matter in the body or outside, etc., etc. This question has proven to be golden, golden. So it's the first tip, uh, how to make the Dhamma alive and keeping this, this question often in our minds, especially when exploring the Dhamma. What does this Dhamma, just taking as an example, the five aggregates, means here, here? Where can I see myself there? Where am I there? 
And then after we, may, we have this mental frame, then we can start going with a very different. So I will ask you to do it together. We are, we are practicing. This is a session of Dhamma. Dhamma is practice and theory. So we just go to one consciousness. Do I have consciousness? What does having consciousness mean? Do I have? Can I know things? If consciousness is what knows, can I know? Yeah, I know some, I know some things. Now, there are different kinds of consciousness, isn't it? Six kinds of consciousness. Visual consciousness. Is seeing happening right now? Can I see? Yes, yes, I can see. Can I hear? What does it mean? What, what is the teaching inspiring me or inviting me to contemplate? Because later on, we'll have all these, all these elements applied onto our practice and starting to see, for example, with consciousness, how the impermanence of it, is it changing? What I see changes? Yes, if I close the eyes, suddenly everything becomes black. Then I open, yes, yes, it is changing. There are still more. These are just the building blocks. So if from the beginning, as it has happened to me in the past, the Dhamma is a theory or a concept, concept out there, I cannot bring it in. The practice cannot really happen. We see Vedana feeling. Do I feel pleasurable and ple pleasant and pleasant or neutral? Yes. Something is there when I see a friend, oh, immediately pleasure arises. An old friend that I see, then when something or some pain, some discomfort, then perception, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whatever dhamma we have, the first thing that can bring us, bring it alive, is constantly having. What does that dhamma, for deep that it is, paticca samuppada, all this arising and passing away, means here, here in the body, can I see something? Here in the mind, can I see something? So we must know where it comes from, know the reference, which book it is. So if we wish to follow, we can go. But just the eye, keeping an eye, not to get lost only into the theory. Both wings of the bird must be strong. The third theory and the applying of it. And they must grow together. Often we learn something and then we just need to sometimes press the pause button. The Dhamma is very deep and then go and apply go and apply. Then the application of it will require, we'll, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty a little bit for more knowledge, what else is there? Then we explore, and then we pause a little bit, and then we, we, we bring it to, to, the, to the practice. So what we want to do is make the Dhamma ours, bring the Dhamma here, make it personal until it becomes our own nature. Good news, all the Dhamma, as we have seen, is designed to bring the most beautiful aspects of our mind, the most noble uh, uh, activity. It's a foster, it's recognized and fostered. So uh, we, we, are, we are in good hands. So the Dhamma, as we know, it's us. The Dhamma is me. The Dhamma is you. The Buddha never taught something, as we know, only for uh, philosophical entertainment or just for intellectual entertainment. Even the deepest of the deepest will have something to do here. So with this, we have the first tip. We, I will be make, making a list so later on. We can have a, a snapshot of, of, of all the things that we will explore. The first tip for, for keeping the Dhamma fresh is keeping this more than the question, this mental frame. What does this Dhamma, you can apply it right now, means here on this body and this mind. Good. Everybody okay? Everybody okay? If you can, the, the people who is in Zoom, can, if you can turn on the, the camera, it's helpful to, to have a, a little closer contact. Okay, we take a breath. Hmm. What does this Dhamma mean here? Hmm. And let's continue exploring. Now, second tip, we will speak about balance. One thing is content. And very often in the Buddha's teaching, we see that things... We develop one thing, but it can come to this side. I, I, we start falling on this side and then we need to develop the other one. Not to, 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 to come to the middle way. If there is a middle, uh, we must avoid the extremes, stay into the middle, but we also need to explore them. So we will speak about balance. And I will take another uh, very uh, accessible teaching uh, about the Dhamma, which are the five spiritual faculties. So as we know, all our powers also are the same, Bala and the spiritual fac faculties, Indriyas. So we know that they must be balanced in themselves. I chose this one because it very clearly uh, 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 gives this, this point that I want to uh, go to. So we know, sorry, I will, I will click again, that 
there are five, four horses and one and one one chariot here on this on these uh, faculties or powers. So on the one hand, we have confidence, sadda, and panya, wisdom. Both of them must be very well balanced because if we have a lot of sadda and no reasoning, no understanding, wow, big difficulties can arise from from that kind of attitude. We can become very uh, credulous and then. Uh, and believing whatever we are told immediately without considering, and then we can become even easily manipulated. So that happens even in, in whole cultures. Now, on the other hand, if we don't trust or have confidence, we just only reason and think about, we can become quite cold or even hard. So then we don't allow for other things that might not be immediately seen. So we must balance these two horses, as we know. Then on the, on the other hand, we have the other two horses, which is Samadhi, concentration, and Viriya, effort. If we have, a, uh, if we have mem, uh, if they are not balanced, we can either get agitated, if we put a lot of effort, 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 and get agitated, and we put a lot of Samadhi, concentration, concentration, the man can become dull and, and fall into energy. So both of these horses must be balanced. And there is the charioteer uh, that will be awareness, mindfulness, sati will be in charge of knowing, okay, how much sada do I have? How much panya is there is? There is, are they balanced? Samadhi is okay, virija is okay. So sati is the key at the beginning. At the beginning, that will be the, what will be balancing the faculties. But what we want to do later on, and this is the point I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to the next tip. Eventually we want wisdom to take the, the reins, the control of the horses, and then the confidence, mindfulness, concentration, effort, and wisdom in se itself is guided because of the understanding that what we are doing is good. I come to this point because I have failed in the past many times and something that has happened because in the teaching effort, as we have seen, very often is, is, uh, is stress, or we must put effort, we, sh we should sleep a little bit less, and effort, effort, effort. Very often, my dear family, Lama family, I have gotten lost just applying effort, forgetting about sometimes even of the other horses. It, it seems apparently sometimes it's only just effort, 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 put effort onto the precepts, and it becomes the attitude changes, and eventually I've seen myself... <laughs> That instead of having five, four horses and one rider, I have all of the horses are effort and the rider is also effort. And then without guidance, it's like a, it's like a boat, sailboat with a lot of wind and no, and no uh, how you say, steering wheel. So eventually I can be go and directly crash into the rocks. I have seen also in some friends that we can burn out because effort, effort. And also this is a... a, a reinforced by our way of living, often society, oh, you must strive, you must do, 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 do. But then very important things we're keeping out. Confidence in ourselves. Understanding why are we doing this and why is it good for us? Concentration, mental stability and awareness. So this thing is something that we must be very, very careful. I've learned this a long time ago, and I, if, you, if you allow me, I will share a personal story. Everybody ready for a personal story? Everybody okay? <laughs> Good. Okay, so I will share. As I was growing up, the first encounter I, I, I recall and have stayed with, with me, the understanding of the difference of the different efforts. So as I was growing, growing up, with being with my parents, these are my three sisters. I am, they are two older than me, and then I come and there is one sister, sister, sister younger. So when we were, when we were small, uh, economy was okay, but not so good. So both of my, my parents needed to work. So my mother would work from, um, my father would work the whole day. He would go to the factory. He's an engineer. And my mother will, will work in the hospital and will stay half day. So it was for us, the kids, a little bit bigger than this photo. This is <laughs> Anitya, ne? How, how it changes. <laughs> We were bigger than this. We might be 10, 12 years old. So it was duty from, I learned from when I was small, I needed to, of course, make up my bed and the room, make it tidy. And then also we needed to uh, work on the chores of the house. So we were four kids. We will divide the chores into four. 
after the lunch, we will, one, of, one of us will, will wash the dishes, another one will undust the, the furniture, another one will sweep, and another one will mop. And since we are four, we will just uh, rotate the one day one, one day other. But I have to confess something. I really didn't like to mop. It was something that I didn't really like. Somehow the, 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 the needing to, to take the water out of the mop, I didn't like it. And I was all the time, when it was my time to mop, oh, there was a problem. Duka, duka, duka. I didn't know back then about any tool, how to do. So what would it be? I, it was my time to mop. Oh, I don't like it. I was waiting, suffering. My mother would arrive and then she will see me there suffering and or uh, upset. And what happened? Oh, I don't like this mopping. I don't like this mopping. And then my mother, what at some of the times, like, like you may know, she was busy. She was tired. Well, you do. Why? I would say because it's the responsibility of the whole house. And eventually she might even reach the point because I am your mother. Oh, I less like it. So I was mm, mm, dosa, 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 mopping, mopping. But something happened one day. And imagine how meaningful it was that decades ago, I still remember, and even people from the old, you from the other side of the world is now knowing about it. That day was special. My, ma my mother arrived, and before it was just out of you should put the effort because we are a clan and we need to do together, and because I am your mom. But then that day, I am again with the dosa, don't like to mop, and then she come and contemplated for a little while. And then she told me, stop, 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 stop. Wait, 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 wait. She said, why? And she asked me, why do you think we mop? Oh, I was expecting that she was going to tell me, just do it. And then, and then I, said, I, I was upset. I said, I don't know, just to wet the floor. And then she, she looked uh, surprised. And then she said, no, 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 no. We don't mop to wet the floor. And then she said, pass me the mop and then she, she, she pointed me do you see this stain on the floor and I said of course I see it <laughs> sorry and then she said look we mop to take the stains away of the floor and then we, we, she showed there was the sun coming through the door and they showed you look like this do you see that dust and then she went and do now you look again you see we're taking the whole thing change the whole world changed at that moment but now when I reflect it was not really the mopping or the importance of the mopping, but the fact that she stopped, she saw me and went beyond to the understanding of the why we are doing that. Why is it necessary to be putting effort? So until now, my dear family, the best gift that she gave me, I really appreciate that attitude. She came, saw me and explained me the why. Believe me, after that, the whole experience of the mopping really changed. <laughs> I was mopping. I was understanding why I do, why I was doing, because really I was thinking in this way, what is the use of wetting the floor if it is going to get dry again? This, this, <laughs> this activity is meaningless. I wet it and it gets dry minutes ago. That was my understanding. She came and changed it. So the point I want to make here, my dear family, our minds continue working in similar ways. As long as we don't go and make an inventory of how, what am I doing? How am I approaching? This can also happen with the Tamma. So very often when only effort is guiding and we are just following because of authority, because of we saw it in the scriptures, which is great to be there, but only because of that or because the monk told us, or often we might do the same to our own kids, when we want to inspire them, but we only share the effort and you must, be, you do the, you practice morality because you must. And if we don't are, if we are not skillful in explaining the other one, in knowing why, wow, we can very easily get into that. So between the mental faculties, we must be doing movements. Sometimes, yes, Panya will lead, but sometimes faith will live. Sometimes, yes, effort will lead, but all of them might be balanced. So the next tip, the, the second tip that we uh, will take for today, it is always try to keep present the why of the practice, the why of the teaching, trying to understand the mind of the Buddha behind the deepest, it will be very deep, but why am I doing this? Why is it good 
to practice morality. And imagine the tools that we will have when we want to inspire our own children. So uh, we must know and be able to explain the reasons and the benefit beyond. And then effort, we don't need to be asking. Later, after that, my mother didn't need to push me to mop. <laughs> so it went very well. Fortunately, uh, there are also some teachings that we will go very quickly. If you wish to take a, 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 a screenshot, you can have. There are the 10 anusatis or recollections, but we will just focus, focus on a few of them, a few that I have seen in the past that uh, are very useful for making either sada or wisdom, the, the confidence in, in myself or, or the uh, uh, wisdom that we possess to guide the practice, to guide the effort. So one of these uh, contemplations is when we contemplate in our own uh, morality practice, in our own sila. Confidence grow. We know we haven't done nothing wrong to nobody. I am, I am okay, I've done nothing wrong. And then when we contemplate on, on our generosity acts, it makes us feel beautiful, wholesome, worthy. And we see the benefit in ourselves. We see the benefit on the people that we are helping and, and uh, the non-harming also. So that makes uh, guide the practice. Another contemplation that is also very helpful for me has been no, uh, remembering that one day I will die. So then I start recognizing, wow, all the conditions are present. All the conditions are good. We have food, home, teachers, teaching. It is very precious. So that kind of understanding, instead of making a dark uh, attitude, it brings and makes shine the um, usefulness and preciousness of this opportunity, just as, as, as some tips. Now, let's go to another part uh, that uh, also it's uh, important to keep in mind. Very often, our culture will influence our attitude in our way of thinking, our, and hence our way of living, hence our way of practicing the Dhamma. So you may see this image and you may say, why, why, what is this image? It looks a little bit strange, isn't it? Like a Chinese temple with some umbrellas over there. Well, I have to tell you that uh, I feel very familiar in Malaysia because uh, I also have a Chinese family. Uh, on a personal note, I was married with a Chinese family. <laughs> For 20 years, my, my ex-wife, now my uh, dear Kalyanamita, you can see her here. Uh, uh, we, we, we share a life together. Now we practice. Uh, I, I am a monk and then she continued practicing and sharing the Dhamma as well. So I also have a Chinese family and there is a tendency that I, I have experienced in, in direct hand. There is the, the uh, kind of hierarchy in the Chinese uh, culture that often it, it, it becomes an obstacle in the practice. And I will say, well, at first I show you this picture. Here is Ye Ye, and then uh, Taiguma, Yikuma, Sok Sok, and Mama. We were in a trip. I didn't, that, that's the only, the only photo I found. So one of the things, having this hierarchy, for example, the Talga and the, the big brother, very often you see that whatever the big brother says, that's what the big brother said, and there is no word after that I have seen being close to the Chinese culture. And this is why I'm, I'm, I'm talking. I know many of you might uh, have descended from, from China. And, and uh, it is very important also to pay attention that often there's this rigidity can develop. And if we are not careful, this effort, 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 you should do just because I told you because of the ladder also is also a, a, an obstacle that can get on the way of our deve inner development. So uh, this is something just to keep, keep around. And on a personal note, may all of them be well. Yeje just passed away a few weeks ago, unfortunately, but all the family is fine. So next tip to write down and to keep present, something has been very useful. Let wisdom and faith guide the effort, mostly wisdom. The why are we doing this? So in order to increase wisdom, one of the elements that I have seen very, very beneficial is curiosity, wanting to know. So until here, everybody okay? Everybody okay? Let's, uh, I, I stop sharing the screen. Let me see, everybody okay? Going good, we continue a little bit more. Yes, okay, we are good on time, we are good on time. So we take a little breath, we are practicing, seeing some stories, contemplating a little elements of the Dhamma, 
we let's try to keep 50% of our attention in the body, 50% attention in the content that we are uh, listening or seeing. So I come back to sharing the screen here, sorry. So I was talking about curiosity, isn't it? So in order to keep curiosity up, something that has been very beneficial and I need to remind myself often, and let's feel it right now. Let's just contemplate that all of this, this library, the house we are in, the building we are in, the streets and the cars, the mountains, the whole earth at this very moment, as it has always been, is floating in the cosmos. We are right, we born floating and we will pass away floating. This planet on, at the same time is turning around a big start, a big ball of fire. And this big ball of fire is also turning into a huge galaxy, one of millions of them. So when we open, open the, 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 the perspective and understand what is happening here, be, biological beings exist, you and me, consciousness exists and is malleable. I am doing something for it. Whatever I think, either good or bad, that is what it becomes. I am an actor of whatever is happening and it's something immense happening, like a miraculous for it to be human beings, for there to be a sun and then look up into the night and see the moon hanging just there with no strings, <laughs> the earth at the same time. So my dear family, something that has been very helpful for me, it's wondering about the universe, astronomy, science. So something, if you wish to inspire young people, ch children, uh, adolescents, something very good to arrive to wisdom. Science is also in one way trying to find uh, answers to reality. We can use the tools that are available, proven facts, and then couple them, put them together with the understanding of the Buddha and the Dhamma, which very often are not far are actually very, very close. Something I want to leave very clear is not that I'm, I, I have no intention of explaining the Buddha's teaching all through science or vice versa, explaining science through the Buddha's teaching. But there are many, many unbelievable points where they meet and we can use for our own understanding and get more detail and uh, promote with, the, with, the, with our family. And we, it's easily seen, it's easily... Uh, uh, understand through bo using both of them. So on that line, both of these uh, uh, knowledge or wisdom finding, understanding finding activities, the Dhamma and science, very often, not to say the Dhamma, definitely is totally focused on, on, the, on the liberation from suffering, hence happiness or well-being. And also science have done a lot. So this is, here's the point what I'm making. The next tip I, I, I wish to, to point out will be uh, keeping this uh, inspiration founded with uh, the knowledge of science. So as far as, as the understanding of happiness, the Buddha has explained, and you will see how many parallels are there, unbelievable. Uh, even, even through the years, my respect to the Buddha has grown much more to see, to just to think how we found out all this without having all these uh, uh, machines and, and means for measuring, how he found out that how the mind works, unbelievable, his uh, wisdom and understanding. So science through measuring our blood and physiological activity has understand that whenever we are happy, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins, the, the, the happiness chemicals arise. So now look at this, this is very, very interesting. Something to keep that, bring the Dhamma alive. This helps me a lot to keep reminding. Whatever I'm sure, the next activities are what science said, it is good to make these uh, chemicals arise. They had the, chemi the chemistry of happiness arrive. Hence, feel happiness, feel joy inside. You see the parallels is amazing. The first thing that is uh, uh, mentioned is contentment, <laughs> gratitude. Science is backing it up. Whenever somebody feels gratitude, boom, dopamine arises, well-being, because we are seeing what we have. Contentment is that. So this is, I think, very useful and also very useful to share with our youth, with our family members, because I think we have a big lack. We are taking things for granted. 
maybe in our generation, when we were a child, things were a little bit more difficult. I suppose many of you will, uh, more difficult than they are now. Maybe, many, many of you will uh, agree on it. But now I have seen teaching also children of many ages, one of the biggest obstacles to be able to contact and explore together is mana or the, uh, or the uh, how you say, pride that there is there. And very often it is based on this sense of taking things for granted. Of course, my parents, is, is, it's, it, it should be as it is and we have everything. We take all things like if it is, it should be there and if it is normal, but no without uh, understanding, without looking that some people lack many of the things we do have, we cannot develop compassion, we cannot develop humble humbleness, and whatever we do have becomes invisible and problem after problem. More craving, more attachment, more conceit. And as the teacher said, conceit and anger are the two things, the two mental ingredients that really dry our mind. A mind with, that is conceited cannot grow things inside. The soil is hard. A mind that is angry cannot, cannot grow. So this is backed up by science. It seems like I was speaking about the Dhamma, isn't it? Like it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reality. Another thing that science says that it is very good for developing this uh, chemistry inside, it is the sense of harmony in community also found deeply in many, many teachings of the Buddha. Another thing is altruism and service generosity in time, generosity in energy, energy, we also find it. Something that we might not find in the Dhamma so much, but it is uh, making exercise daily. We also, this, uh, we also secrete these this, uh, uh, endorphins and, and good chemicals that makes us feel happy, laughing, etc., etc. And one more that is really looks like books from, from, from the suttas, but this is scientific finding, benevolence, that metta and generosity makes us happy. Yes, when we are being generous or sending blessings, may you be well, happy, peaceful. All these pleasant uh, physical sensations and mental states arise naturally in the mind. So manasa and sukha in the body. So this is what science says. This is what the Dhamma also said. But here comes the point that I want to arrive with. The next tip is coming. We know that happiness, when we are happy, because of the presence of these uh, 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 chemicals and the somanasa states, the beautiful mental states that develop from it, happiness is very pleasurable. But here comes the human mind. We are so, so clever. We say, okay, wait, 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 wait. So there is pleasure and there is happiness. But you know, this business of happiness is a little bit uh, troublesome. We, I need to be generous. I need to help somebody else. I need to give something away. I need to go and make exercise, etc., etc. We are so clever as a species that we, at some point we said, why don't we take this happiness thing away? And we just go directly to the pleasure anyway. This is what we, what, what, what we, what we feel directly, isn't it? And here comes the problem. Pleasure, we start only trying to find pleasure and just make an experiment. Go to Google, go to Google Images and just type happiness to see. I made it just to make an experiment. So I put happiness, dun, 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 and I got a, a, a screen like this. And after screens and screens and screens and screens and screens of images, everything boiled down to the next thing. It was what makes people happy? It seems like for a way in the internet, the collective consciousness, if you wish to call it like that, agrees that happiness is either vacation, food, romance, or entertainment. That was it, really, after pages and pages. And then you come and ask, but where is contentment? Where is gratitude, generosity, altruism, loving kindness, compassion? None can be found. And then here comes the problem, something that we must keep ourselves present. As a teacher says, there is happiness so cheap, so cheap, so cheap that we can buy it in the shop in the corner. And yes, it is true. We can go just pay a little bit of, of, of money and then you get happiness. But what kind of happiness? For how long? And very importantly, what are we getting? Are we getting pleasure or happiness? And because this happiness or pleasure is very feeble, we must repeat it over and again because it finished very quickly and then again and again and again. And we, before we know it, 
we become just slave. We, we might have become already addict to many of the things. The mind can crave whatever it can touch. My dear family, this is something very, very important to share with our kids. Very, very important to share as soon as possible with our youth, understanding that this can be very easily mixed because happiness is pleasurable, but not the other way. And I will give now some, some statistics, which are a little bit uh, hard to swallow, but anyway, we have the safe, spiritual safety belt. There will be some spiritual turbulence, and not, not so much, but it's necessary to know. And it is the fact that the suicide rate in the world, unfortunately, it's increasing. And it's increasing. And what is more shocking, something that whenever possible, when our kids are on age, it's going to be good to explore it. And I do with the students. It's important and they can take it. When we look at the statistics, most of the people that is suiciding is people who is middle, middle uh, income and high income, middle uh, social status, economic status and high status. It is not happening so much in lower income or, 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 or economy uh, uh, spheres. And when we look at statistics, last time I checked when, when making these images, the countries that we're having uh, the most suicidal uh, suicide per, per year was South Korea, United States, and Japan. And as we know, these countries, because of the economy, economy they possess, they are not countries that lack access to pleasure, isn't it? So what is happening here? Something very, very important that is costing really uh, not just mental health, but physical harm. A full life can become uh, turned off because of misunderstanding and mixing of these things. So the next point that is gonna be very useful for our lives, for our families and for our Dhamma practice is keep always present that pleasure is not synonym of happiness. It can come on one side, happiness is pleasurable, but pleasure not. Really, really important. I have seen when sharing the Dhamma with young people, uh, it is, it is uh, essential to arrive as soon as possible to this point. So, uh, everybody okay? Until here, how are we going? Everybody fine? We are good in time. We take a little breath. We know we are here. We are listening, exploring, seeing some ideas. Mm. And for the next, next and last part, we are good on time. I will go through some quick tips. Uh, I knew the time will be passing, so we might, uh, we might, we will just see uh, some of the tips that might be useful for keeping the Dhamma alive. And at the end, we'll have a, a full list of what we have seen. Very often, our mind forgets about the practice and the Buddha knew it very well. That's why he recommended so many uh, contemplations. The Satipatthana Sutta, or it all refers to remembering. Sati means remembering again, contemplating all the Anusatis. Anu means, as you know, uh, repeatedly, uh, Anusati, having awareness of something continuously, or uh, anup uh, Anupasana, also seeing continuously. So let's look at some of the teaching of the Buddha and how we can apply it in a quick tip in our daily life. So the bhikkhu, uh, the, the, the Buddha uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number 19, said, bhikkhus, whatever a bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. So if the Buddha, and we know how nature works, what we can do cleverly do is use the, the, the form of nature, use it to our advantage. So whatever I, I turn my mind to, the mind will become for good or for bad. This is, this is a, a ethically variable. If I often do bad, it will go to bad. If I often ponder on good, it will go to good. So one very practical thing that I have seen that, that is uh, very easily to apply in our daily life, it's our phone. <laughs> This is an object that we have cons. We are looking at it. Anupas, anupasa. Phone, 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 una anupasa. Tío, how to. <laughs> anupasana. Anupasana, how we can put it. Phone, upasana. Phone, upasana. Mm -hmm. So, in average, just in average, and I'm being very, very uh, uh, mild on it, 
Apparently, we are looking at our phones from 30 to 90 times, but there were much more. There is even in some of the phones a counter how many times we turn it on. So if this is something that we're gonna, we are going to be with, why don't we make our phone our best and closest? Well, not our best, but our closest, Kalyanamita. So if I'm going to be looking at the phone so many times, we can hack the mind and help for the spiritual practice. And one thing that I have found, for example, this back background, I use it often. And then what do I put? I put my the teachers, I put my family and people that just by thinking of them, even if I have not learned from them, inspire me some good quality, either wisdom, compassion, love, uh, understanding, reminds me of the practices. So uh, on top, for example, of when I went to India, uh, Kusinara, the place where the Buddha passed away, was a very meaningful, very touchy. It's one of the reasons why I'm a monk right now. <clears throat> and then seeing my seeing the teachers there closely. And then on the bottom, if I also want to contemplate and, and grow wholesome qualities, I have my mother, my father, I show you my sisters, dear Kalyanamitas, and just teachers or people from any kind of of, uh, of uh, um, um, religion, as, as you can see, uh, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, but people just by looking at them, if I'm gonna see the phone, sometimes I may see somebody and this is reminding me, the phone is helping me to do, seeing my father and mother, very easy to develop meta immediately. So if I'm gonna be looking, another tip to do is check what backgrounds are we having. And also for other qualities, if in the right thought, the Buddha said that there are three characteristics that we meet must be uh, that must be alive in order to have right thought, right thought. it would be the sense of uh, uh, detachment, compassion, and loving kindness. I made this image, and I, I will tell you what it means. When I put it on the phone, immediately kicks me onto a wholesome mental state. So this image is based on a fact. Unfortunately. In the world, every day, 350 children, sorry, talking about the phone, 350 children are dying because of lack of food. Today, unfortunately, 350 mother and fathers will be mourning or crying for their kids, not because of a disaster, not because of an accident, just because they were unable to give them food. So very often when I put this image in the phone, just when I open it immediately, the mind very clear, very fast make the, con the, the connection and then immediately compassion arises. For all the parents that might be there or the kids that might die today because of weakness, may they be well, may they be safe. And another thing also, another benefit I find, internal benefit, although the news are bad, that helps me a lot, it is the perspective. Sometimes I feel, if you see in the center of the image, I have some others. I just found the images, put them together and keep it there. If you wish to take a snapshot or screenshot, you can put it on the phone, I recommend. Often I feel, well, if I feel find myself suffering because something happened, somebody didn't talk to me in a nice way, something that I wish didn't happen, then for some reason I open the phone and see this, and then I ask myself, imagine if I were beside one of these 350 mothers of, one, of today, because tomorrow is going to be 700, and after tomorrow, 1,050 moms on fathers suffering. If that mom will ask me, do you suffer? And I will say, yes, I'm suffering this moment or something like this. And then if she asked me, why do you suffer for? My dear family, what, what could I say? Why? Because I have no Wi-Fi? Because the phone broke? Or because that person did spoke how I like or saw me as I like? Wow, very, very, uh, I find very useful ways to hack our blind habits and with something that we are looking constantly, use it as our Kalyan Amita. So that's another practical tip. I'm sure you must be doing something about it. And as you know, there are apps already about mindfulness that you put how many bells a day or just the normal alarm of the phone. So something I do is in moments that I know it is not gonna be disturbed, disturbing, like in, in, the, in the school or in the work or something, it's lunchtime put an alarm and make a, you can put something and then stay for a minute and you just a minute makes a big difference 
coming back to the body. We know how to contemplate the body sensations, the breath. Just take a moment, accept, release, and move on. We continue with our work. So that's another way to make our best, uh, closest Kalyanamita. And lastly, another uh, more, uh, another uh, tip that has helped me greatly. I learned it many times, uh, many, many years ago. I still use it and it works wonders. Anyway, I shower every day. I eat every day. I wash the hands many times a day. Uh, walk from one place to the other. So from one, one time I said, oh, my teacher told me, you say you should not shower anymore. I said, teacher, how come I don't shower anymore? No, no, no. You won't shower anymore. Now, from now on, you will meditate while you're showering. Wow, teacher, so nice. So I'm taking a shower. Anyway, the shower is happening. I'm fully, but I haven't, I'm getting second benefit. I am also cultivating the mind to win, win-win situation. I am clean, but the mind is stable. And we can have just by, my dear family, really, it's very simple, but don't underestimate the simplicity of it. Whatever you do, eating, I will not eat anymore. Teacher, I will not eat anymore. How come? No, no, no. Now I will do, I will meditate while eating. Wow, big difference. It can be moving from place to place, opening the door, uh, commuting from your house to your job. I won't go to my work. And the wife will say, why you don't go? No, I will meditate while I'm going to my work. Big, big difference. So the point I'm calling with all of these tips, which is the last one, and I will make now the list so we can have a snapshot. My dear family, we need to be creative. Bring the Dhamma to the bones. What does that deep Dhamma means here and how creatively I can make it my own, apply it in daily life, and somehow with all respect, have fun with the Dhamma. Check, have the effort there present, but without being a dictator to myself, I will have fun with it, make it, may enjoy the Dhamma. And yes, even for the jhanas, the Buddha spoke that sukha and piti, happiness and joy must be present. Happiness and joy makes um, sweet the practice and allow us to see the deepest truth, the truth of suffering, the truth of loss, etc., etc., in another lens, and we rejuvenate our practice and bring joy, enjoy, interest, and the effort. Forget about it; it will be automatically because automatic because we are seeing the benefits. The Dhamma, as the Buddha said, is beautiful at the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. Beautiful inside, we practice generosity, we practice morality, and try to be as wise as possible. We also bring beauty to the world. So, my dear family, with that in uh, good time, uh, let's take a look. Let's uh, recap. Um, Let's recap what we have seen, some of the tips. Hopefully you find a few of them can be useful or inspiring. Start. I will encourage you to try them all. So what we have seen today, let's take a little recap. We have seen some points. So the first one was keep a mental frame. Ask ourselves, what does this Dhamma for deputies means here? In body, in mind, in this body, in this mind, or as in the Satipatthana is uh, the Buddha explained, also outside. Wow, we contemplate. What does the Dhamma mean? That, does that person have perception or a, or a Rupa? Then we, we, we continue growing. Next, next uh, uh, tip that we saw was knowing clearly why are we doing what we are doing. I have seen myself practicing something that stopped giving me benefit, but just because of habit, I continued practicing for years. I was wasting time. We must know very well where we are what is the goal we are trying to achieve with certain practice and know clearly, oh, the goal is fulfilled. I may come later for that. Let me explore with some other thing. So our practice does not get stagnant. So keep present the why. Remember the mopping story? It really changed the whole, the whole adventure. The whole effort was easy after that. Let next tip is let wisdom and confidence in oneself, faith in oneself and in the Dhamma guide the effort it will be automatic. We don't need to push ourselves when we see the benefits we are getting from the practice, clear. Keep curious and inspired. Science will do a lot for it. 
Remember that pleasure and happiness are not synonyms. Be very careful for this and let's try to pass this information to our youth and children as quickly as possible in, the, in, in due time and in, with elegance. We can have many daily reminders as we, as we know. Uh, and the Buddha left many, many other tools that we can explore and using the meditation levels. So with this, my dear family, this is the tips that we explored today. Hopefully they are useful. You can take a screenshot. And with that, everybody took the screenshot already. Hopefully some of them are useful. For me, years, some of them have a company and they are turned out to be priceless, to give a good attitude and fresh, fresh approach to the Buddha's teaching. Mm. So with that, good time. Uh, I would like to close, uh, let me see. Uh, hopefully these tips can help us to keep the Dhamma alive. And because of a request, uh, some people were asking what is happening in Mexico. So I use this opportunity that now we are together. Would you like to see the projects in Mexico? And so we can rejoice the benefits that the Dhamma is, is, is already taking over there. So I will go and show, I shall already show you. Uh, here is where I born in this green green area, and this Mexico City is over here, and I, I am on the on the east side of Mexico. So I showed before the workshops are still are, are going. There is also I want to mention there is also an English uh, uh, channel. It is the whole Abhidhamata Sangha, the explanation of the Abhidhamma according to the Abhidhamata Sangha. The nine chapters are covered. They are explained in the way, uh, very graphically, as I as you saw now, using a lot of images and, and animations and trying to bring it down to, to our daily practice. If anybody wish to, to take a look to the videos, the course is finished and the channel is called Anatomy of the Mind. It's in English. If you know a friend that is interested, it is there. Something that is surprisingly happening in Mexico, then the local culture and even religion is getting more and more interested in the Buddha's teaching. So I've been invited to, to this university of future priests to explore what is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. As you can see the faces of everybody, we are happily as monk brothers with different, different practices, but sharing, it's going very well. Uh, another thing that is happening, as you may know, we have in Latin America, not just in Mexico, a big problem with drug addiction. So the next image might, might shock you. This group of people, 2,000 people there, are parents who have a children or, or, a, or one of member of their family uh, in a center to, uh, to go get out from addiction. Imagine these are the parents of the children. So I've been invited to speak not just with the parents, but also with the, with the people with the addiction, all kinds of heavy drugs, alcoholism, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, talking, the Buddha's teaching has been very, very beneficial because it is very uh, direct in dealing with the nature of attachment and the importance to see uh, the, the practice for, for allowing the mind to let go, be very careful about pleasures, et cetera, et cetera, and how to balance the mind. So this uh, retreat that you see there was for the parents because very often they feel guilt. They feel like, what did I did wrong for my kid to, to go and get into drugs? Imagine horrible situations. This is the work that is done with the parents, but as I mentioned, also with the inmates. This is not a jail, but these leg centers where they, by force, often they, keep, they bring them. Sometimes they need even to, to put a, a, an injection so they sleep. And when they wake up, they're already in the center. So you can imagine the anger or the violence, sometimes aggression that they might experience. So I've been going in Mexico to dozens of these centers. There are many. Um, it, is, it is a plague. It, it is so many happening in many, in all the states. And we are uh, exploring the Buddha's teaching and also kindness and forgiveness because to, to try to ease the anger or aversion they have. So this next image, you can see they are male, female, and this next image is, is very shocking. When going to these centers, you can find already kids 10 years old already in the center. So that means they were already a few years outside and they were using heavy drugs, even sometimes heroin, and the parents have the need to bring them to these kind of centers. When you start seeing these 10-year-old children, 
I mean, sometimes it's heartbreaking and I want to open the invitation to all of you, my dear family, here in Malaysia, I, I have seen a little bit the culture, whatever we call troubles, you compare it to, to the things that are happening in other parts of the world, because drug addiction is not just bringing the addiction on the kids or, or the general population, but the whole culture around. There are many killings because of the gangs that are trying to bring the drugs from South America to the United States. I won't get into detail, but horrible things are happening. A big need for developing and promoting SILA. Imagine just by following the five presets, how and people is in, feels inspired, how many things will be um, improved. Uh, now, uh, another thing that we are doing, it's uh, before the kids get into drugs, uh, we are having activities with children and explaining them the dangers that are there and the options that they might have in order not to depend the importance of right, friendship, etc., etc. So this is part of the work that is uh, going on. And as uh, Brother Bobby mentioned, uh, we have been working for the last uh, five years now, five, six years, trying to establish, uh, we're st still on the way, a place where people uh, can come. It hasn't yet started because it's not yet finished. Uh, can come and learn more about the teaching. So uh, we found a, a piece of land in near the city, but in the forest. So it's very lucky. People can go and come in the same day, no problem. And uh, it is a very suitable environment for uh, sharing the Dhamma. It won't be a retreat center. It will be mostly a, like an institute for learning the Dhamma. So I show you a little bit how the project is going. This is the entrance and you entrance through a tunnel. There are, there are uh, three levels you will see now from the front and the gardens, some, you are received by some fountains and we try to incorporate the Buddha symbols and teaching all over the architecture. A very good friend of, of, uh, of mine from France helped with the design. I made some drawings and he, he, he expanded them. So the door itself entering the, the the, the tunnel is the Dhamma wheel. So we, when children come, we explain them about Sila Samaripanya already using the door as a, as a teaching tool. You come inside the tunnel and as you arrive to the first uh, place where you leave the shoes, we will put a body tree here already. Uh, we, uh, when I was in India, collected some trees directly from the Mahabodhi and tree after trying many times, three of the seeds came out. So now the trees are a little bit uh, like uh, 40 centimeters. So one is gonna be here and it was gonna be taking the sunlight that the photo was taking at night. So the, from the top, and then you come in more tunnel and this is one of the rooms. And then you climb the stairs to the, to the classroom and uh, dining hall and Dama, Dama classroom will be like a Dama sharing space. This is the view from very fortunate. The land is not very big. It's like 1,000 square meters, but it is just on the edge of the forest and the forest is a uh, protected area. So it feels like you're in a very big monastery because you can just go outside and walk and walk and walk. It's 100 hectares of forest. So you can walk for a long time, anytime, because it's uh, protected around with a fence. So you can even walk in the night. So this is the view. One of the toilets still need to do some finishing in the flooring, uh, glass work. We also design it to, to teach the, kid, the kids about samsara, life and death, and how we can purify the mind until we attain Nibbana, etc., etc. This is the view of the place from the garden in front. We came from the back in through the tunnel into the middle layer le level. So you come into the middle and you can either go up to the, to the Dhamma sharing area, dining hall, and Dhamma classroom, or down to two other rooms. You actually has, only have three rooms, one, two, three. And this is the meditation room where the big Buddha from, from Burma, we were lucky to, to find it and be, uh, make it come to the monastery. And you can see here with the local people, some native people are coming, everybody is very interested. And for you to know how much work is needed to be done, the first question everybody or many people does is, is this the Buddha? And then I say, yes, that's the Buddha. And why he is not fat? That's the first, oh my God, <laughs> again, here we go. I have to explain. And then they ask, can, can it be, give me a blessing? And as you can see, they bring flowers and fire because it's, it's a, some people from the local tribes around, they are still around. They have this sense that everything comes through blessing. Then it's a very good opportunity to, to speak about the Mangala Sutta, et cetera, et cetera. So very interesting. But yes, my dear family, a lot of work still to be done there. 
and also already is benefiting the Dhamma. But anyway, uh, I don't know when I'm going back, but uh, we'll continue there. We also made a stupa. Lastly, this is around the size. And this is the view from the monastery facing the, the forest. You can walk as far as you can. And you can also do walking meditation around. We made uh, some walking paths around so you can do uh, endlessly around and around or in any direction. So can also practice also in these uh, levels. So that's what's happening. I, 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 I share in order that we all rejoice and know that the Dhamma, it's already bringing benefits to my own family. My own mother has improved in many senses her attitude towards life in general. So I cannot be more blessed by the Dhamma in such sense. And also many kids and, and as you see, more people will be benefit and um, I will continue trying my best. So I will hand over for, for that's for my side. I will ask finally and, and pass the, 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 the time for uh, brother Bobby, if he could also help me to put in the chat, the, there is a Flickr album with these photos and more. If you are interested in seeing, looking at them, you can take a look. And from my side, my dear family, may all these tools and inspiration help us to continue making the Dhamma alive, close, close to us. It's, it's on you, brother Bobby. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bhante, for your very inspiring talk on making the Dhamma life. Very, very uh, practical tips. And uh, so, some of you may be wondering, looking at the, the building, that uh, Bhante must have a lot of support from Mexico. Is that true? Uh, you are. Ah. Well, yeah. unfortunately, as you know, the Dhamma, it's uh, just uh, getting planted there. So the culture, no, no, it's, it's not there. So actually the whole monastery was uh, built with the savings. Uh, when I was working as a, as a lay person, I was a musician and a teacher. So with my ex-wife and I, the savings that we had for 10 years before I knew I, was, I wanted to become a monk, uh, as far as we have arrived with the monastery, we used also one auntie of her help with one part so until how we arrived it was used by that but no unfortunately the culture uh, catholic culture doesn't have this sense of uh, uh, support because generally the church have support from 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 the vatican or i don't know how they find and generally people is it's, uh, not with this attitude as we find in asia for example where buddhism established oh. mm. So yeah, we are we are uh, we are trying we are trying our best to do whatever and also sharing to the people the importance of generosity etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But until I come back, I will see wow, how we're gonna arrange even for hands round. I'm not, I'm not sure yet where or how I'm going to do it. But I think everything will work out. The dhamma the dhamma works uh, away. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you, Bhante. So for those who uh, wish to support Bhante's uh, efforts in propagating the dhamma in Mexico. We have uh, put a link uh, for the SBS uh, Sangha Fund where you, you can just make donations there. The link has been posted in Facebook and uh, you just put donations there and put comments uh, for Pante Rahula's monastery. Okay. And uh, also, if you have any questions for Bante, kindly write in your Facebook comments and we'll pick up the questions for Bante. Mm -hmm. But there is a question starting to start off mm -hmm. from yeah. Brother Yu Ming. Uh -huh. How can we strike a balance between reflection and contemplation in the discourses of the Buddha and the path to Buddhahood? Mm -hmm. Well, reflection and contemplation, uh, there are some similarities on the word. Uh, so uh, contemplation is looking at something over and over and reflection is a little bit more on the thinking so then here the discourses is we will might start first uh reflecting about it we read something and then we stop for a little while what as, as i mentioned what does this means here how can i apply this and then i start contemplating on it now quietly without thinking about it just taking from the suttas or from the discourses taking the the direct instruction for example, uh, we take the Anapanasati Sutta, how to contemplate the, the, the breath. So we distill the instructions and what do I need to do? We think about it, how can I apply it? And then we start quietly contemplating. For example, we know when that we're breathing uh, in short or long. And then one part that helps me a lot, and he, here's the point I'm going to striking this balance. You know what I do, Mr. Leung? 
what I do is I just take very simple instruction. Once instruction, talking about the sutta, just taking one example, has been the Buddha uh, instructed us, release the physical and the mental, uh, tranquilize, uh, first, sorry, first recognize your mental and physical intentions and then tranquilize them or, or somehow release them. So how to strike a balance? I study the sutta, I reflect on it. Does it make sense? Can I do it? How is it? And then when I contemplate that practice, I don't get the whole sutta. I only distilled a very simple one phrase or even one word. I make it, boil it, boil it down to one word instruction. Then when I am meditating and practicing, the balance start coming there. It came directly from the discourses. I have good, good uh, information, good instruction. Then I start applying it just by remembering that word. For example, often how I use that I just say tranquilizing or releasing intention. I only use two words. And as I am contemplating the breath, either sitting, walking, or moving around, just remembering this two words, release intention. Or sometimes, because I know I just use the words release. I know it's the physical intention. I know it's the mental intention. And in that way, I have found that it can be strike a balance between the theory and, and the practice. Another thing just to mention from the Anatalakana Sutta that now I'm practicing and it takes, it will take us years to continue practicing. The, the instructions and the wisdom of the Buddha is so, so rich that even one or two instructions can last us for years, last us for years. One the, of my favorite, I learned it in Pali because it's also very inspiring. I, it's kind of, if I'm hearing the Buddha talking to me, uh, uh, I repeat myself, netang mama, ne so hamasmi, na me so atati, which means also I sometimes I say it in Spanish, make it make it close to you. I say in Spanish, I say this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. From the Anatalakana Sutta, it has been very beneficial. The sutta is long, but the essence is that what do I need to do? So when I am contemplating this experiencing. This listening that is happening, this seeing, this life, is it mine? I make the question. Well, how come it's mine if it is changing? This body is changing. I cannot control what I see and what I hear. It just comes. The bird, the monkey jumping from the tree, what I think even is, 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 is based. So is it mine? No. Am I this? Well, it's changing. Is this the atta? Then in that way, we can strike a balance. But the main point would be, extract extract instruction make it as simple as possible so we can be contemplating throughout the day yes question from Bra brother yao chan yes does mexicans believe in karmic reincarnation oh no 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 not at all they uh, more i mean generally of course there are some now buddhists in mexico my own mother now start reconsidering but uh, no, no, no. Now, we, as, as you know, uh, we are, I mean, the general uh, population in Mexico is Catholic. So no, there is no belief in karma. There is no belief in reincarnation. As you know, in theistic uh, uh, religions, there is the belief in God that is the creator. And that's the one who either praises or punishes our actions. And when we die, there are two possible uh, locations, either heaven or hell, and no more, the, the eternal life, as they call, but no, no, not much. So this is very difficult when you try to speak about sila or morality, when people or the culture have no sense that of responsibility. Wow, what I do will bring me either good or bad. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, but yes, answering your question, no. Mexican people does not believe or know even about karma. Karma is very misunderstood. Often it's thought like, as, oh, you have bad karma, like something bad happened to you. Then when I come, no, actually, karma is action, neutral, either good or bad, it gives result. People is very shocked because uh, there's a misunderstand misunderstanding about karma. And reincarnation is too foreign, too, too, <laughs> too strange for people. They, 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 they get, they get uh, very surprised by it. But something that I used to ease, I said, you know, nature recycles everything, isn't it? When a tree falls down, that becomes another tree or something. If And then I asked, is consciousness part of nature? And people generally say, well, yes, yeah, if everything is part of nature now in the universe. Yeah. So nature just recycles things. Nature is very, the universe is very big. So people is getting open, open, open to it. That is a, it's a difficult thing to address. Né? But karma is very useful. 
and they take it easier than reincarnation or rebirth. Yes. Uh, another question, Bhante. Super and creative Dharma talk. Please advise how to experience non-self. <laughs> I'm also looking forward to experiencing. The first thing is uh, knowing the teachings of, of the Buddha and how to approach it. And as I mentioned right now, the non-self uh, remember the, uh, the Anatalakana Sutta will be one of the must what kind these three questions that we must be keeping to ourselves this is not mine doesn't belong to me this I am not this is not myself so while we experience it I will share something that has been very inspiring and useful for me I haven't experienced non-self totally otherwise I, I, I would be <laughs> I would be uh, have the, the, the work done still work to be done but uh, I'm uh, trying on the way, something that I would recommend uh, uh, is imagine. How would it be to have a mind without self? What, or another question, what makes my mind think about me, myself? And then a lot of information starts coming. For example, the things I have, have a sense of mine. The people or the family, I think is my mother or my friend, something. As long as the mind, I, me, mine is there, immediately the identification. Then the question comes, how can it be? Can I just make an experiment? What would it be to have no sense of self? Start making some experiments. Remember the Buddha's teaching. And I will enc highly encourage to note and repeat ourselves many, many times contemplating. This is not mine. If this is not mine, we're already tackling attachment because mine is from attachment. No, this I am not is mana, tana, mana, the self. Or, and this is not myself, diti. So the three main ingredients that are binding us to samsara, Tanna, mana, and diti, which are the essence of papancha, or the anibana, the non-freedom, what keeps us here. These three questions very skillfully, the Buddha. That's why many people ask, ah, but this question is very similar, no? I am, this I am not, this is not myself. What is the difference? It's because each of the questions is addressing each of these uh, uh, chains that we have towards samsara. Tanna, desire, mana, ego, or, or, or sense of, uh, of myself, and diti, the wrong view that there is an atta or something that doesn't change. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself over and over and over and make experiments. And one day when the degree of wisdom and mental stability is on the right spot, Let's not underestimate it one day, hopefully very soon for all of us, my dear family, the mind just make the click, understand, and at that moment, recognize that letting go and peace. We will arrive there. We are in good hands. We just continue walking. Mm. Yes. Keep your questions coming in for Bhante. Uh, <laughs> another question from uh, Brother Yu Ming. Who are you and who am I? Very good question. Very good. Question. Many layers to, to address that. In ideas and wrong view, what we think we are, but in ultimate reality, just a natural process that doesn't belong to us. A natural process of matter that is born and is getting old without our permission. The body does not ask us, can I get old today? No, it will just continue. And also the mind based in cause and effect is a natural process. So uh, one very healthy way to address the who am I is starting to make peace just with nature and started releasing the ideas of possession. It doesn't belong to us. It's a natural process running in cause and effect. Cause and effect. And very importantly, in this cause and effect, we can, we can direct it, ne? The causes, we are doing it with our mind right now. The karma of the past is planted. The seeds of the past are planted. But the present one is our responsibility. And we can sue. We can plant today who we will be. Who am I? The actions that I made in the past. The fruits, physically and mentally. The habits, mental habits and physical habits, I am now. Who I will be, this is in our hands. This is the important part. We can change for the good. Consciously making a uh, wholesome, wholesome, and that I think will be the most uh, relevant and important uh, contemplation to keep who I want to become. So hopefully we all decide wisely. Mm. Thank you, Bante. Mm. A question from Tigris Lupert. Bante, I'm curious, as a Mexican,
person who is exposed to the Catholic religion, what inspired you to be a Buddhist monk? Curiosity. When I was a child, I was very curious and I got into trouble very soon. When I was going to Sunday school in the church, I may be like six or seven years, I started making some questions. So since uh, when I was a child, I was making questions and to be very honest, the, the answers were not very satisfying because you always reach, at least on, Catholic, on, on, on theistic religions as I grew up, to a point where, okay, I can explain you until here, but from here on, you just believe me. And then I was always, oh, no, no, no. Something is not, I want to understand, not just believe. So that led me, in short, ne? Uh, I was a, born a Catholic, but when I was 12 years old, I quietly gave up the, rel the religion, although my parents were not very agree on it, but because I saw the priest doing something different than what he was asking us to do. So I kind of get a, a little bit separation. So when I was 12 until I was 19 years old, I was kind of religionless. I still go to church because my parents sent me and because there was a choir and I was learning how to play music there, but, but I continue going. Then when I was 19, very fast the story, I got into Hindu meditation and that really shaped, uh, shape, uh, open possibilities. Then I went into Native American religions. I stayed for eight years working with the ceremonies, but also the question, I keep doing the same questions and there was always a place, oh, from on now on, you believe me. So fast forward to 2001, I had the first meditation retreat, silence retreat, and I heard the Dhamma for the first time. And when I heard the Dhamma for the first time, I don't know what is inside, but like, like if a bell ring and I, the mind says, yes, 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 that man, is speaking something that I can see directly. He's not asking me to believe, but asking me to investigate. Wow, that was my water. And then that was uh, 20 years, 20, 20 years ago. And the rest is story. I just continue pulling the thread. I got more interested. I ordained temporarily for the first time. Oh, very interesting, the Dhamma. I discovered the Abhidhamma and the explanations. The questions become clearer. To the, the answers becomes clearer to the point that now there are more answers than questions. So are now a lot of work to do still, but, uh, but uh, this is what brought me to Buddhism. The clear, the clarity on the answers can be experienced directly, yeah. Thank you, but talk, you shared about uh, some of the pitfalls you experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you did like uh, putting in too much effort. Mm. So, is there any other pitfalls you'd like to share with us so that we can save some uh, time with our practice? Mm. Yes, keeping the mind open that we will be, and the Dhamma is very deep, and the things that we understand now, and the mind says, yes, yes, really, really, it is like this, it might change with new information that we don't know yet. So as a scientist, like, a, like an open attitude, as far as I know right now, I understand as this, and it is useful, but I am open. I haven't seen and explored all the suttas and all the teachings or a teacher that may come and help me understand a thing that was very clear. So it has happened, the pitfall, to be close, to be sure about something. So always keep the mind thirsty for something is around. Until now it is working. Let's see what else I, I can find. Uh, be careful with effort. Uh, another thing, I think all, all the, the things that uh, were shared today are on these pitfalls. Like I see danger on, on to practicing something without knowing the why, just because we are told. And sometimes we may spend years doing something for which the purpose was covered already in the first two years. And I continue practicing for 20 years. So then there was a loss of time. And I have seen friends feeling this loss, like, oh, I practiced this and, and it was done already a long time ago. So we must know effort and be kind to ourselves when we, ah, this is another one very de delicate. Whenever we don't follow the precepts or make a mistake, kindness towards oneself and I, myself. And I, I think I, I need to do a lot in that regard. Although sometimes uh, we treat ourselves too harshly. And the first one we need to develop compassion because of our ignorance is us loving kindness and patience because it's going to be still uh, our way to go. Mm. Yeah, Th thank you, Bhante. Thank you, thank you. Mm. So that, that wraps up all the questions and uh, thank you.
Pante will like to share the closing. Okay, let's do it together. Let's uh, remember, uh, let's share the merits of this session of our intention to, to cultivate and to do good, to know about the Dhamma, to, to, to stay together and do it as a family. So we will transfer the merits of, uh, of our good actions to the people who has departed in our family, great grandparents, and sometimes parents, a friend or something. And also for the people that is alive, we share the benefits of our practice for the benefit of all beings. And I will just recite, you can read and we recite together. Uh, sharing the merits in Pali. Together we go. Heta watacha amhehi sampadang punya sampadang sape sata anumodantu sapa sampati sidiya. May all beings be benefited by our good actions. Definitely it will. Nature is like this. Mm. Now we go transferring mer merits to especially to the departed ones. May they, wherever they may be, whatever kind of continue, wherever they continue their journey, may they be surrounded by good conditions for their well-being in the body, for the mental stability and peace. And we recite three times. Together we can read. We go. Idame nyatinam hotu sukhita hontu nyatayo. Idame nyatinam hotu sukita hontu nyatayo. Idame nyatinam hotu sukita hontu nyatayo. May they be well wherever they continue. And we make uh, aspiration. And by reading together, I can read and you listen, contemplating. By the grace of these merits we have accumulated, may we never follow the way of the foolish. May we be blessed with wise friends and skillful teachers who help us along the path of the Dhamma. Wherever we may be until our final liberation, may we never stay astray from the path of the Dhamma. May we always have the chance to practice the Dhamma and one day, hopefully not very far away, realize the highest bliss, the liberation of Nibbana. Mm. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Bhante, for Thank you. Mm. the wonderful sharing and uh, for the very practical tips. Mm. So this talk will be posted on YouTube and uh, the links to the Bhante's uh, monastery photos will be put there, the Flickr mm. links. And also the those who wish to support Bante's uh, efforts, we will be putting the details of the SBS uh, fund into the, the account number in the YouTube link. So please look out for the link. And it's also be posted on the Facebook comments. So once again, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you, you for tuning in and uh, may all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much.